Welcome to the Growth Buyer Podcast, where we engage with top business leaders who share their experiences and provide real insights that help them attract customers, retain staff, and grow their bottom line. Now, let's get started with the show. Hi there, I'm Kevin Horrigan, host of the show, where I feature inspired leaders from various backgrounds and industries willing to share their stories and insights. Our podcast is brought to you today by Spinutech. Spinutech is a 160-person digital agency who helps their clients attract new customers, grow existing, and ultimately be more successful in their revenues and client satisfaction. Thank you, Spinutech, for your sponsorship. Our guest today is Ed Buckley. Ed is the CEO of Fit on Health, a platform that makes it easy for insurance carriers, brokers, and employees to offer a variety of fitness experiences to their clients, employees, and Medicare members through their PeerFit product move. Ed has raised over $60 million of investment capital. He leads expansion strategies by fundraising, driving national partnerships, and continued business development for FitOn. Ed is a multi-award winner, including helping his company win USA Today's Great Places to Work and was number 140 on the Inc. 5000 list. Ed, welcome to the Growth Fire podcast. Thank you for having me, Kevin. Absolutely. Well, I'm super excited to have this conversation. Um, but Ed, um, while we've known each other for a while, I might ask that you maybe would tell our audience a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, um, maybe you like what your thoughts are when you're a kid, you know, maybe what you thought you wanted to do for a living and share some of that insight with us. You know, ordinarily, when I tell people where I'm from, they'd be like, oh, I'm not sure I've heard of that. But because of all the class action lawsuit commercials, everyone knows where Jacksonville, North Carolina or Camp Lejeune is, which yes. is where I was uh, was born. My yes. dad was a Marine, and so I was born in Jacksonville when he was stationed at Camp Lejeune during the class action lawsuit period. So I should probably jump in on that. But I was uh, I was born on the East Coast, and my dad being a Marine, and then ultimately transferring to Navy, and we moved around a lot. And uh, you know, I saw that always as a huge positive. I loved moving every couple of years, getting the opportunity to meet new kids and new schools. So. Uh, it was just, it was really fun for me growing up. And I think it it helped develop me to, you know, who I am today of always looking for new, kind of looking for the new opportunities and really being ready for any scenario or situation. When you're growing up, did you think the military was going to be your calling? You know, you know, people who are in the military, it's kind of like the police. Yeah. If your dad was a cop, you're a cop, your grandfather's a cop, kind of the same thing in the military. My dad, Right was Marine Navy. My stepdad was a Marine. Um, several family members close had gone there. I actually went to the University of Florida on a Navy ROTC scholarship. So it certainly looked like that was going to be the case. And uh, luckily for me, they have an opt out. If you have like their top tier scholarship, you get one year of, of college that they pay for everything. And then at the end, if you go into second year on that, then there's a commitment, but you can opt out. And I just got through that first year and I thought, you know, I think there's so much that I'm going to be able to do that isn't where my, uh, I think, interests are going to lie. And I'm very happy for the opportunity that it gave me, but I'm really, really happy that I trusted my gut and went down this path uh, that's led me here so far. So let's talk about college. You've uh, quite won quite a couple of degrees out there. Can you tell us about you know, what you went to school for, what your original study focus was, and maybe your journey, and then the continued degrees you pursued, and the intent of, uh, the why, and the intent of what you'd receive in return for doing all of that? I'm a three-time Gator, so if you're a Gator out there, go Gators. I actually got back here, my Gator 100 award, so uh, once again, go Gators. I'm sorry for all those Knolls and Bulldogs, but uh, yeah, look, I went there in 2004. I studied communications, actually focused on, on health communications, and then would go on to get my master's in uh, public health policy, and then got my PhD in health behavior where I focused on digital health. So I van wild it, but I totally got more than one degree while I was there. Yeah, no, that's great. And in, 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 in you know, going after that, that path in, in college, was there an end career that you thought that if I did these, if, if I pursued these different degrees, if I gained this type of knowledge, if I learned these different types of experiences, was being the CEO of the company you're at today what you thought that it would become, or where, where did you see it taking you? I definitely knew I was not an academic. 
And people that are in academia have such a great discipline when it comes to research. I always knew that I wanted to bring ideas to life, which to some extent is the opposite of what they're there to do, right? They're there to be dispassionate and just research and move on to the next research idea. I would read these research papers and say, oh, so now let's go do something with it. And that's where I certainly was oil and water with a lot of the um, people that I went to grad school with who, you know, if you're getting a PhD 98% of the time, you're doing it because you want to be in some sort of formal academic, you know, uh, research facility. And that was just not me. I never, never thought that this was going to be the path for me. Uh, I didn't, I have no business, you know, formal upbringing, no business school. Uh, no one in my family, you know, had gone on to, raise venture capital or start tech companies or anything like that. This was just the complete, um, I don't know if serendipity is the right word, but I'm uh, just so blessed the, the journey that I've been able to have so far. So, um, so let's talk about the transition out of school and into becoming an entrepreneur. So can you tell us, you know, did you have a few companies before the one you're, you're in charge of today? And, or did you start to get lucky with the first one right out of the gate? Give us a little bit of insight on how that worked. So I started a company the it, it, during that like undergrad to grad school phase because I graduated undergrad one year early. So I was like, what the heck? I've got a free year, you know, like the year I was going to not be in the workforce anyways. So I started my first company. It absolutely was not a tech company, but it was focused on fitness, wellness. This was when like worksite wellness was first coming about, if you think about like the mid 2000s. So I was really intrigued. And I had that company for probably six years. And it paid for me to basically live like a king in Gainesville and go do grad school, run the company, learn a lot of mistakes of what it's like to run a company and, and manage people. I was very terrible at it. It was not sophisticated or by any means mature in my professional development, but it gave me a lot of lessons and it gave me all of the capital I needed to uh, be successful at that stage of my life. Yeah, yeah. So then I started. So then I started PeerFit. Sorry. Then I started PeerFit, which led me down this twelve-year journey that I've been on. Two M and A uh, transactions. You know, raised a lot of capital, uh, grown this company uh, to be one of the most notable brands in in the space. So let's talk about let's talk about that. So I uh, started as PeerFit. It's it's fit on now. Been set a couple yep. of transactions in between where it started and, and where it ended. Starting it, what was the idea behind it? Um, did you have did you have any partners when you got started? Maybe tell us a little bit about where the idea came from and who was around you when you were getting started. So the idea was originally that what we do today is just a piece of it, right? That was somehow pulled in. We knew that people wanted to to find the best fitness experiences around them. So this was during the rise of boutique fitness. So if you think about like. 80s, 90s, early 2000s, big box gyms, one membership, 12 month memberships. That's all people did. Right. And then all of a sudden in the 20 teens, there was flywheel and soul cycle. And you, know, you started to have the, the rise of hot yogas and CrossFit. And so there was just this fractured amount of high quality fitness experiences out there. But at that time in its infancy, you still were only picking one place. Right. And so we saw the opportunity to be able to hop from place to place to place, which was so against the fitness model. Right. 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 We assumed that if we could create a frictionless jumping off point, that everyone could be a winner, the gym, the member, everybody, that there was going to be something there. We also thought that as Worksite Wellness has become more of a thing, if we could capture the, the wallet of the health plans and the employers, that'd be a really important component of the offering. What we didn't realize was that was going to end up being the entire business, right? Yeah. Can we go get the share of wallet that employers and health plans are putting to work and manage it for them so that it's really easy, seamless, and then help drive maximum engagement? That's what has made us be successful. And then that's what helped us go into the Medicare space as well, where you had basically one player for the last 20 years doing it for seniors. And it's the same product that it was 20 years ago. Right. So it was really interesting for us to go into that space and, and disrupt things. Yeah, no, what a great vision. And um, our company, Perfect Client, you know, we definitely like what you said, you know, there was such a diversity of different types of fitness experiences that the, the big box gym just couldn't offer anymore. So for our team to be able to 
be able to go to a spin class and be able to go swimming and be able to do CrossFit and yoga and all these types of things, you know, that was, you know, it was, it, uh, it brought that all together. And like you said, so, so not what the gym model had been for so many years. Um, so who were the founders of the original company? Yeah. So sorry, my, uh, all of our grad school buddies, right? So I was working at a gym. I was doing my master's in public health policy. So I'd worked all summer on this idea. I'm starting to start it. And then just like the people you hang out with, they're like, Hey, you want to help me out with this thing? And next thing you know, we had a group of four of us. Uh, we were all in grad school for completely different things. And everybody brought something different to the table. You know, we're meeting at Moe's or we're meeting at Starbucks or, or meeting over in our living room. And it really was that, it's that kind of classic stereotypical startup story where you, you work and you've got classes during the day and you work on this all night. And, you, you know, it was just, it, it was a really fun time. Having said that, Whenever I go and start my next company, I hopefully will be able to skip a lot of that just because of the knowledge and, and resources that I have this time that I didn't have, you know, previously. Well, uh, we're supposed to be wiser on the journey. So if it went, <laughs> ever takes place, I hope you can take the 12 years of wisdom and be able to learn from it. Yeah. So, Ed, you know, you talked about you know, started just pure fit and it's had a couple you've had a couple partners who've helped come in and into the business and help it for different purposes. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey? Yeah, you know, I knew nothing about fundraising. And so everything that, you know, those early days we did was we read as many blogs, articles, there weren't a lot of podcasts, if you think about 10 years ago, and just made ourselves absolute experts on scaling a business and doing so with venture capital. And so once again, for those of you, I'm in Tampa, Florida. Um, Florida was one of the worst states for early stage capital, venture capital 10 years ago. Despite being one of the biggest economies, this was a commercial state. This is a tourism state. This is a real estate, um, you know, investor based. And so it was nearly impossible to raise capital. And every lesson that was out there was the Silicon Valley model of raising capital and scaling fast. And so we had this great playbook, but we didn't have the resources to pull it off. Right. And when we looked at all the other startups in the state, they were doing the Florida model, which was really not scaling fast, barely being able to use capital. Um, I just was like, well, we'll figure out a way around that. So we started raising capital any, by any means necessary. Friends, family, people that we knew just by talking to as many people and asking for introductions. We knew no investors by any means. And then as we started to have some traction, there were really some influential people who leaned in and supported us. They absolutely had no reason to other than they believed in me. They believed in hopefully where we were going, right? Like Mark Blumenthal at Florida Funders, Lee Arnold, which, you know, we've both, you know, he's, he's been there for both of us, uh, Jeff Vinnick very early on. And, and so they were able to come in and put the amount of capital that we'd been looking for to run this playbook. Um, I also was able to go get a great external board member, Jim Phillip, who's been my mentor now for years. And really had no skin in the game other than to just help a young, you know, entrepreneur. And, and you know, what resulted, as I mentioned, to you, you call that, like, we were 140th on the Inc. 5000 a year ago. Right. And we did it the right way by winning national cultural awards. So we grew, which was impressive, but we grew the culture, which was really equally as impressive for us. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you talked, you know, part of your journey was having around great people. And you talked about, you know, Jim Phillip being a mentor. I don't know Jim. I know the other three that you mentioned a moment ago. But uh, in your journey with with Jim, um, did you guys ever talk about he was acting as your mentor? Or it was more of a unofficial, you were just feeding off of anything you could get out of him. But can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I actually met Jim when we were first, first, first raising capital before everybody else came in. And he was like, look, you're way too small for where me and my partners in bed. He made some introduction. He said, if you ever need anything, I love your energy, love your passion. If you ever need anything, just call me. And so, you know, you call him from time to time, bounce ideas off of him. And then as we started growing faster and faster, I started calling him more often, started calling him more often. You know, and then I told him, I said, look, I'm adding you to the board because you're one of the most objective people. And you, you've helped me more than anybody. So I don't think there was ever a time where there was a formal discussion, but it's really pretty well known, you know, and even to this day, you know, after the last exit, he's not on our board. He has nothing to do with our company. I still call him regularly just to, you know, hear advice and, and see what he's working on. And it's just, it's been a great friendship for sure. 
No, and I think Ed, you know, I, I think every guest on this podcast I ask, you know, maybe where they got some of their experience and, and mentors is a big one. So I ask the same question every time. Did you and your mentor have a formal conversation or was it more just something that just happened? And it's about a 50-50 split right now. Some who had very formal, no, I like, you know, I want to learn from you. I'd like you to be my mentor. And others, you know, they were just there for them and you know, like like Jim was for you and and, and others were. And um you know, I think many of those people believe, you know, what goes around comes around and things of that nature. And, you know, it's it's great to know people with that type of expertise are willing to contribute their time and for others out there who are growing in their journey, you know, surrounding yourselves with other people who have been around before is a great way to get educated and finding mentors is something that seems to be common around many of the guests we have here on the Growth Fire podcast. So I'm glad you shared that with, uh, with us. Um, so tell us about your fit on team today. How big is the team today? And um, what are their challenges right now? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, if you think about, so we put these two businesses together, right? So we put fit on, which is traditionally a direct to consumer, number one fitness app out there for those of you who are listening, right? 13 million members, uh, just absolutely category leader. On the traditional peer fit side, we're B2B, we're really a B2B to C, right? We sell the health plans into employers. And then we activate their, their, their members and their users to, to find fitness experiences, mainly in person. So especially during COVID, this was a beautiful marriage where you took the best in in-person and the best with digital and you put them together. What's been so fun about the journey for me is, you know, I've been CEO of a B2B2C company for a decade. And to then go join the exec team in the board of this category leader, direct-to-consumer, number one fitness app where the founders were multi-time you know, entrepreneurs creating some of the best companies like All Trails, Postmates, and things like that. Right. Um, I've learned so much in the last year. So it's been one year, literally one year since we consummated the closing of that, the merger. And just how much I've learned about the direct-to-consumer app space and then the direct-to-consumer fitness app space has just been amazing. And I hope if you talk to Lindsay and Russell, they'd say, man, we've learned more about B2B and healthcare than we ever right. thought we were going to have to. Right. Um, so the, you know, the combined team is for well under 100 people, north of 50, under 100. Yet, you know, we're on pace to do 50 million in, in revenue. So re revenue per employee is just fantastic. Yes. Um, you know, the, the, the joke that we always have with each other, the consumer business has amazing margins because it's kind of a tech play. Right. The B2B side has amazing LTV to cap, but lower right. margins because we're reimbursing the in-person. So right. between the two, like we each bring something great to that the other one doesn't have. No, no, that, that, that's a way to, I mean, I'm sure that's part of the value proposition of bringing all together and stuff of that nature. Um, and it's great to hear you, you know, continuing to learn in your journey and stuff of that nature. Um, so Ed, we you know with this team that you have that's north of 50, but below 100, um, and the CEO of the group, what is it that you find in, in today's world? We think we're finding it, an employee engagement can be difficult in this. What are you finding right now is helping keeping your team motivated? Ooh, that's a great question. You know, what's interesting when we took these two companies together, um, we kept them separate to not mess with any of the mojo. Well, there's so much overlap. Let's just say there's 80% overlap in culture. There's still 20% difference. And yeah. as you think of like when you have kids or you have siblings, as soon as one person has something and the other doesn't, it's like, whoa, why do they have that? And I don't have that. So yes. That was one thing we were pretty thoughtful with as we were merging the two teams yes. was no matter how similar they are, there's still some differences. There's still things that one side has and the other doesn't and vice versa. So we were really pretty thoughtful about that. And because our side being B2B was larger in terms of people, we had a little bit more of that infrastructure from a cultural employee engagement. So we've, uh, on our side, as we put the two teams together, really been a lot of the driver behind that just because we have that, that muscle memory built up. But, you know, one thing that I've just always tried to do is look for a remote company. We try to make sure that you feel completely engaged and not I'm isolated in, in remote. Right. You know, our, our Slack channels, half the Slack channels have nothing to do with work. The number one Slack channel at, at the, the, the traditional PeerFit side was PeerFit Pets. People sharing pictures and videos of their pets all day at work, right? right. The next one's PeerFit Juniors, where they're sharing pictures of their kids, or PeerFit Postcards, where they're sharing their vacation plans. So we really try to let people brag about who they are 
and, you know, kind of their, their family, the, the things who they are away from work. So I think just being able to, to not just know that you've got kids, but to like make sure you know that we care that right. you've got kids or your pet or so on. Um, and the other thing is, you know, pre-COVID remote, unlimited PTO and a fitness benefit. Man, you're right. in like the top 5%. Now, post-COVID, we need to really rethink what were some of the benefits and offerings that we were going to drive to the members, or to, to our employees, that was going to be top tier rather than right. just, oh, my gosh, we're middle of the pack now because right. everybody's doing something like this. No, that's you know, so true. One of the things that Lindsay and Russell do, and so this was something that we inherited from the fit on side, generally at the end of each calendar year, we might give out gifts or we might give out swag for everybody and everybody right. loves you know, their Lulu swag. But this year, for the first time, what Lindsay and Russell do is they put aside an amount of money per employee that you pick the one or two charities that is going to go to. And every single person in the company does this, and they get to pick out their ultimate passion, which is, you know, a nonprofit or a charity. And then we shared with the whole company all of the different types of charities and all the different types of causes we've been able to impact and affect. And it was so crazy for me, like, as you well know, like, I try to donate personally to a lot of tears, but all of a sudden being like, oh, let me call up so-and-so and say, hey, I've got a last minute end of year, which, you know, is important right. to nonprofits, right. donation for you out of the blue and unscheduled. It's just kind of a cool feeling. It's so I, I love that. And I think it was really special to our employees. No, I think that, that, that that's great. So I just a few moments ago, you commented that, you know, the company's been growing quite well. Your revenue per team member is significantly high and stuff of that nature. What are you finding today that's helping you grow the company still? You're number 140 and change on the Inc. list a year ago. What is it from a combination of sales, sales and marketing, direct sales? What are you seeing as kind of your company's go-to-market approach as you're acquiring new probably B2C and B2B customers? What, what are you seeing as things that are working for you? So a, a couple of things. In terms of same store sales, so our existing logo that we're growing within, a lot of this had just had enough years in them. We survived COVID. Our partners survived COVID. They're now ready. You know, they put a lot of growth on hold for a few years. Just waiting it out, frankly, was allowing us to expand. The other is having net new offerings. So now we can look at our same logos and say, we've got the traditional gym network. But what about digital? What about areas where we were too expensive an offering and we can drop in digital or we can create new digital content just for this segment. So that's a lot of, a, a lot of same, same store sales, so market expansion there. Then with our existing rolled out clients, the technological expertise from the fit on dev team has let us go into our own product and maximize engagement. So we've increased revenue per life significantly yep. in the last year. So we pulled the numbers earlier and it's something like, I think it was like a 38% increase in revenue per life. So wow. forget about even having to grow more, more lives. We just were getting more revenue from maximizing engagement with, uh, with our own users. And then net new logos. Once again, we got a lot of attention by putting the two brands together. We <laughs> certainly stood out now amongst anything that was out there. And look, our sales team is having the best. They had the best Q4 we've ever had. We're already having the best Q1, you know, that we've ever seen. So new net new logos were on fire. Revenue and engagement per life is up, as well as net new sales from existing logos. Literally hitting it on every single front. A lot of that is just the expertise of those two teams coming together and coming together really well. Yeah, that's great. That's that. Congratulations. That's a. Great to hear you say, you know, that sounds like um, everything is dialed in really, really well. That, that, that's awesome. And so uh, two more questions for you. Uh, the first one is, is um, I always respect people who, you know, walk the talk and, you know, the CEO of a fitness company, right? And so you just recently competed in Ironman. Um, and so can you tell us about that journey and maybe, you know, what you learned in, in your training journey and how that maybe translates translates into into your work life yes so for everyone who's following i'm like oh which one did you do? so uh competed in the iron man the half iron man 70.3 in florida it's in december every year it was just it was my first one what a fantastic experience 
So it, I assume it's like any major, major, major uh, endeavor that you've never done, but you've heard stories from other people. Like no matter how much training you think you needed to do, that first one, you never did enough. You just don't know till you go do it. Like I immediately ended and I go, God, I want to sign up for next year's because I think I can drop 30 minutes off my time for, for next year. And I trained a lot. Uh, there's this joke in the Ironman community, which is you can have a life, you can work and you can train for an Ironman. You can only do two of the three, but you can't do all three. Right. And really, I mean, every single weekend is devoted to training and then recovering from training. Right. Because going out and doing a three and a half hour cardio session in the Florida heat, like you're done all day. Like right. you're going to pretty much lay on the couch and need to recover. And as many of you know who are in Florida, uh, so we're training in the fall. It's still 90 degrees almost every single day. And it's 80 to 90 percent humidity every single day. Right. So the, the like scheduling and just raw dedication to time. But I'd say the number one thing that I learned was nutrition planning. And I don't mean like, oh, let me eat healthy and let me eat clean. I mean, like figuring out the actual amount of protein and carbs and most importantly, electrolytes. Doing electrolyte planning became like a math exercise and you, you know, testing on yourself. And then when you go into the fact, as I mentioned, it's 90 degrees and 80% humidity. You're just sweating so much. You almost can't put enough electrolytes back into your body. Um, so that was really difficult, but it all paid off because on the day of the race, I never cramped one time. And I was wow. so fearful right. of doing that because you're just going so hard for six hours. Yes. And um, I mean, I'm, I was eating electrolyte tablets every 15 or 30 minutes, you know, yep. you're taking powder. Right. Um, and so the fact that I got nutrition right was actually something to me that I was most proud of. Uh, on the day of the race. But, um, you know, I'm, Emma pushed me. That was like her third or fourth one. She had her best time ever. So to have a training buddy, like I would not have done if I didn't have a training buddy, um, especially one who w was more advanced than me that I could look up to and uh, emulate. And so the, it was just a great experience. I absolutely loved it. I loved all the support that my friends and family gave me. I'm happy that I have a really flexible work day. So on some days when I don't have tons of meetings, I don't feel guilty about taking a two hour lunch and working, you know, working out right. because we have flexible days. We certainly have days where we work 12 and 15 hour days and we try to be really flexible with our teams on days that you're not busy. Don't be busy. So. Right. Yeah. No, well, congratulations for finishing that. That's huge. Thanks. It was humbling. That was for sure. <laughs> so humbling. I love that. I love that. Any of that, any of that. So when you think about in the role you're in, any of what you prepared for, has it, has it helped you rethink business at all? Yeah, actually, it really has like the the non sexy stuff that that plane, like the nutrition planning, the stuff that sometimes as leaders, you're like, oh, let's have finance to do it or let's have operations get involved, like making sure that you really are maximizing that stuff. Yeah. And not just me, but making sure that every team understands yes. why we're doing some of these things, why we're doing certain operational or finance things like that's It's important. Yeah, so uh, tackling the hard stuff, not just the easy stuff, is the leader, right? Stuff that comes naturally. Yeah, making sure we're that, uncovering the stones that are the less pleasant things, but when they're left uncovered, they probably don't work out to optimum performance, like where you guys seem to be performing right now. A hundred percent, yes. Ed, so last question for you: um, Where do you get your inspiration? Do you read? Do you listen to podcasts? See where where are you finding a way to continue to stay motivated yourself, educated, and continuing to grow in your own journey? You no, know, I love books. I love uh, Audible and, you know, the rise of podcasts. There's seemingly a podcast on every topic and every person. So uh, I, between my books on, on uh, Audible or just listen to podcasts, you know, I try to listen to you know, 10 to 20 hours a week of wow. content. Yeah, that's significant. That's, that's great. And I assume training, you would probably listen to some of that while you're training. Yeah. You know, everybody thinks I'm a complete psycho because I listen to podcasts or books while I exercise. Right. So during, during Ironman, I was getting through a lot of content. I mean, like, like, uh, I, th I think we were doing something like 55 hours of 
pure cardio a month is uh, what we were doing. And so that was 55 hours of Audible and podcasts every single month. So I had so many different types that I was listening to. Um, but yeah, you know, I, um, I don't really listen to music when I exercise. I actually listen to people talking. Yeah, no, I, that's, you know, a lot of people do listen to music. It can help boost them. But um, what a great opportunity if you have a passion for listening and reading and things of that nature. I mean, 55 hours the, of, of time a month to be able to be able to get that fill is amazing. I do want to say something, actually. A lot of people don't know this, and, and I didn't know this when I did the Iron Man. You are not allowed to have music during the course. No headphones, no music. And so if you think every training session, you've always had music every run. Like if I go to, a, I've got a half marathon this weekend, you just throw on your headphones, right? So you have to do the entire race. You can't be blasting music on your phone, on your bike, nothing. It is just you in the course. And I bet that, you know, people don't plan for that. That could hold them back a little bit. I certainly know I've you know, been a time in the car, a great song comes on and you're tapping your finger or whatever it is. Next thing you look down, you're going 50 miles an hour faster, right? The music got you going. People use that as a motivation for fitness too. So I didn't know that. Learn, learn something new today. Well, you know, and, and, and that's the last part of what you learned. is like that self-doubt and self-talk that gets you through the, the hard times, whether it's business, life or whatever. Man, it's just you and yourself talking to yourself on, you know, the back half of that race when you're tired and the sun's up because it's noon and it's hot. Yeah. You got nowhere to hide. You got no music to motivate you. It's just you and your own mind. Yeah, no, it's mind over matter. Absolutely. Well, Ed, thank you so much. We appreciate you spending some time with us today. And if anybody wants to connect with you after this uh, podcast, what's the best way they can get in touch with you? Fit on Health. Uh, just go search us on Google. You'll get our website, all of our social. Uh, we're, I'm personally very active on LinkedIn. So you can always reach out to me, Ed Buckley on LinkedIn. And I uh, certainly try to be responsive. And yeah, thank you all for listening. Great. Ed, thank you so much for being a guest on our Growth Fire podcast. We really appreciate your time today. Thanks for listening to the Growth Fire podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. Oh, 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 o